start with 210, saved by the blood of the crucified one, 210. Thank you. Thank you. I was here last Sunday and got on a coffin jag and I couldn't stop. And I left the sanctuary a couple times and ate a bunch of cough drops. Got home and was just, I felt pretty good Monday. And I was supposed to go to North Carolina, so I drove down there and my wife got sick for Thanksgiving. So I drove 300 miles to put my wife to bed. Anyway, she's doing better. But we've got a pastor down, a whole family, and um, we've got somebody I've known for 30 years, Gloria. I just, uh, I was blown away when I heard she had a stroke. She's 57, 58 years old, having a stroke. Kind of scary. But the good news is that she seems to be recovering. Hopefully the speech 
and the uh, mobility. I mean, she's a beautician. How many women in here have had her hair done? You know, but she's a beautician. She uses her arms and legs. That's how she earns her living. So I'm just, I'm, uh, I was shocked. I'm asking everybody to pray for her. She's like family. I've known Gloria. I know you guys have known her a long time. I've known her over 30 years. And uh, just, it's like family, you know. Um, wanted to uh, bring her up for prayer. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to take Christine to Fairfax. She has a, a four-hour infusion deal. And the thing is, it's right across from Fairfax Hospital, so... If I can get away, I'm going to go over there and see if I can visit Gloria while, we're, while she's there, if she's still in the hospital. So, uh, Pray for Christine tomorrow. She has no adverse reaction to anything. She hasn't so far, but that's, they monitor pretty close. So, um, And my friend Jim O'Mara, who used to attend here, is in day eight or nine of 15 days of radiation, and he's pretty sick guy. Over half of his liver is, has a, a tumor on it, and they're trying to shrink it. So I'd appreciate uh, any prayer for him. I know he would, too. So, Anybody witnessed anybody this week? Okay. How about salvation? Who do we have for salvation? Nobody? Okay. Sickness. We've just gone over three or four. Um, Betty, how about your neighbor's seven-year-old granddaughter? Um, my sister, eight years, she's about two. And I think the weekend I remember, so she's about eight, I think that's when she was at church. Okay. All right. Anybody else for the sick place? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to tell my children. Her admission test and her release test go negative, but her job won't let her come back to work for two weeks and she didn't have symptoms, so, but she is home from the hospital. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The cancer has come back? It's on the brain, right? We're eight years old. Ten? I'm sorry. I thought he was, oh, the other one was eight years old. Uh, what, what hospital is he going to? Uh, Ohio, okay. Uh, I know there's, there's some people that, that specialize in it and some don't. So, I mean, I just, an oncologist is an oncologist, but some people just are a little more advanced than others. So, um, again, we ask to pray for the pastor and his family as, as they recover. Um, ladies with child. Yes, ma'am, you had something? Before that. It's not you, right? Okay. Henderson, blood pressure. All right. Um, Tim Green has some sort of mass um,
they need to do a biopsy on, and he won't get that until the 16th, so if you'll keep him in prayer. Um, now we've got Howard on the road. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. She did pass. Okay. When I lived in St. Charles City, there was a family that <clears throat> my kids grew up with. My daughter's fifty-three, and uh, this family, Todd, this young man, Todd, who was well, thanks up till Thanksgiving Day. He grew up, and if, if, if I opened the door, I never knew who was sitting at my table for dinner, and that's the kind of house we had. And this guy, same age as my daughter, was not feeling well, went to the doctors. He had cancer throughout his whole body, and he died within a week, and he's my daughter's age. So it's, uh, it's devastating for a family. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to bury any of my children. And I don't think it's supposed to be that way, but I don't know how I would ever handle losing one of my children. So, um, yes, sir. What's her name? Lachlan? All right. Um... um how about unspokens? So three. Okay. Work situations. Work decisions. Yes, sir. What's his name? Jane? Dennis. Okay. Um, I ask you to pray for um, Rafe Parker and his wife, Amy. For, there's a marital issue there. Both believers, both churchgoers, and the devil's getting into marriage, and um, it's a shock to me. It shouldn't be. It's the world we live in, but the uh, devil's hard at work and has just devastated that, that marriage. I pray that uh, something can be done to heal it. So, um, Anybody have anything else? All right, we've got street preaching. Um, in the plate at 2.30 this Sunday, the 12th, the Finance Committee meeting, and play practice. Uh, Sunday the 19th at 3.30 p.m., there's going to be a Christmas play. Um, and Anchor Baptist Church will be on CDs this semester. Chuck, have, have people been contacting you about that? Okay, all right. I'd like to have them. I'm sorry. I've been negligent. Anybody have anything else? All right. Yes, sir. Oh, I didn't. I did last Sunday. But David Borman's son, uh, 24 years old, passed away from a stroke. Yeah. Uh, It's when? Hughesville. All right. Um, again, that's that guy's been <clears throat> struggling for a while with health problems and everything else, and um, 
for this to happen. It's we're not you know we're not supposed to bury our kids. That's the way I think about it. So does anybody have anything else? Mrs. Who? Uh huh. Is it sickness or is it? Okay, health. We'll just. Lord knows what it is. All right. Um, Alan, would you pray for these people on the prayer list? Uh, the offering, a pastor, uh, in the spirit of this church. Smooch, you want to come and do a special? We're done. I was coming.
Anybody ever watch the TV show NCIS? Okay. Tonight I got home. I, well, this afternoon I was flying around with my cousin. My cousin is a farmer. He farms up and down the East Coast and in South America. And he had to run over to the Eastern Shore. He says, why don't you come fly with me? And he's the one that got me interested in flying anyway. So we fly over, and he's got a really nice airplane. He flies it a lot, and the engine's got over 2,000 hours on it. Well, manufacturer says at 2,000 hours, it's called TBO, to be overhauled. And his compression's good and everything else, and he's like anybody else. He squeezes the nickel until it turns into $20. So we're riding, flying across the bay in, a, in this plane. It's TBO, but it's still mechanically sound. And we're climbing up. We're, we're getting up some altitude, and the plane goes... I'm saying, what was that? <laughs> but then I come home, and I, all I'm thinking about is I can't swim to the shore from this, in the middle of the bay. I just can't make it, you know? So I come home, and NCIS, NCIS is on, and show opens, and Gibbs goes to his little diner that's underneath the bridge, and he walks in, and a guy shoots him. And he starts, his life starts flashing before him, and then... Mike, whatever that other guy is who used to want to call him Proby all the time, was talking to him. He says, I wasn't done yet. I don't think any of us are, done, are, are ready to be done. Because that's why God says life is but a vapor. None of us here knows when it's going to happen. If, if Does anybody in this room want to know the moment, or the, the day, the hour, the second that they're going to die? I don't think so. Just not, it's not something that I, I would look forward to, and I don't think that um, anyone in this room really wants to know when they're going to die, but God said you're going to die, and that's something we have to deal with. That has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. Exodus 20, verse 1, And God spake these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them 
that hate me. Isaac, would you pray? Now this, this text takes place in the Old Testament 4,000 years ago. And God is speaking to the house of Israel. Israel could hear him. And he's starting to give the list of thou shalt nots. And I don't think there's a lot of people that just resent authority. So if I come up to you and I'm pressing you to do something, you don't want to do it, your natural reaction is rebellion. Well, the Lord's talking about people that hate him. People that make gods out of things that aren't gods, but are gods to them. They make a god out of something so they don't have to obey the living God. Okay, it's called sin. We try to put fancy colors and terms and words on it, but that's what it is for those that hate me. That's God saying that, for those that hate me. Now, we're 4,000 years actually almost 6,000 years past that time, and there's still people that hate the Lord. They don't believe in Him. You should love the Lord with all thy heart. They don't believe in Him. So the, and the opposite of love is hate, right? Well, in the Old Testament, them that hate me, indicated that if you're in that same family, that family of people, um, you, might, you, you, could, you could love God and not, not be included in that group. It's a type of forgiveness. In, in this section of Scripture, and I'm asking you to go to 1 Corinthians 15, but in that section of Scripture, he starts giving out the Ten Commandments. And those are laws by which Israel had to live by. And it, there, there, was, there was the Ten Commandments, but somehow or another, another 1,500 things you had to do were printed in the Bible because we couldn't do the simple things, so I had to explain it to you. You know, that's why law today is so complicated, I think. You can't just say one thing, you have to say... But if this happened, then you have to do this and this and that. Well, thou shalt not, and whatever comes after it is what we're not supposed to do. But through all the years, Israel says, I can't, and they're listening to God's voice. The mountain's on fire. Chuck, if the mountain was on fire and God was talking and you kind of knew it was God, do you think you'd pay attention? Do you think you would heed those words? Well, the mountain's on fire. There's a loud voice that sounds like thunder. There's some lightning for special effects to get your attention. And a bunch of thou shalt nots come out. And what do the people say? Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore lest we die. That's like turning... When you, whenever you speak to Ron, do you talk to him and he not hear you? Tell the truth. <laughs> Chuck, you ever does Shirley ever talk to you and you not hear a word she said? <laughs> You're a liar. <laughs> well, that's kind of what's happening here. Well, 6,000 years later, God makes it real simple for you and for me, he has to make it simple for Jim Hansen because I can take the simplest thing and screw it up. By the time it comes here and goes through the brain matter out this side, I've changed it. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which ye also have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye, who is ye? whoever does it, are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. A falsehood, right? 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. So, there's just a couple things a reasonable individual has to do. What are they? You've got to believe, right? He died for your sins. He was buried. And He rose again. Those three things are the simplest things in the world. You just have to believe it. Why did He do that? Because we had a sin debt we couldn't pay. Go to Acts 26. When, do, do you, and I believe everybody in this room is saved, okay? Do you have friends that are not saved? I have a lot of friends that aren't saved. <coughs> I blame myself for that sometimes because I don't dig in a little harder, take a harder stand, and push a little bit. You know, I'm a, I'm a kind of make friends first and then put the gospel on you. Acts 26, 8. Here is something that is so simple, it's the cornerstone, the cornerstone of my faith, and it's, it's the easiest thing now for me to understand, hardest thing in the world for some other people. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Do you believe that? Is it hard to believe? It's supernatural. I didn't see it, but they wrote it down in that book, and that is a history book. I didn't see that happen. But I can tell you what Jim Hansen did. Jim Hansen was raised a Catholic for 40 years. I would go, and my first, the first parish priest I ever had was Father Repetti, scared to death out of everybody. You know? The next parish priest I had, I was a mature adult, at least I, I, was, I wasn't mature, but I was an adult, and he turned in to be a drinking buddy with me. Okay, we became friends. And I'd sit there and go to confession, and I'd say, I'm not sorry. He goes, well, I absolve you for anything you are sorry for. Let's go have a beer and eat some chicken. And that's kind of the way it was with the priest. So I lost all respect for that. Uh, but at a John 19, 41, says, Now near the place where he was crucified was a garden, and in the garden a sepulcher, where never yet a man had been laid. Greatest news in the world came out of a graveyard. When I got saved, I was a pallbearer in a Catholic church with a Father Kevin Hart, who grew up one street over from me in southwest Washington, D.C., Okay, we grew up together, and I'm a pallbearer at my Uncle Jack's funeral. If you ever go through Brandywine, Dyson's store, that was my uncle. And I'm, I'm a pallbearer. My cousin, I picked him up because he also was a call, pallbearer. For, in Clinton, Maryland, go to Piscataway at seven miles, took about seven minutes, and he gives me uh, the gospel out of uh, Genesis 12, Abraham's promise. I still don't understand how I got saved, but I went through that conversation, seven minutes worth, that's how long it took, and he tells me the blessing is Jesus Christ. I knew Jesus Christ, I've seen the picture of him, I had a statue of him in my bedroom that my grandmother, Catholic girl, gave me, one, and the Virgin Mary, okay? But he, he was not personal to me. Do you think it a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? Why do you have to raise the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. This is what I'm telling my friends. The people that knew Jim Hansen as a derelict, as a drunk, as a... I wasn't a good guy. I'm still not, but I'm better than I used to be. All right? <clears throat> people that knew me then. Why should it be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead. He raised the dead because my Savior died on the cross, took my sins to hell, deposited them, 
was raised again on the third day. Sit at the right hand of the Father. I know this guy now. I met him. I met him in a graveyard on Wednesday, October 30th, about 11, 10 in the morning. And my life has not been the same since then. That was 32 years ago. So I know it's real. It happened to me. I was there when it happened. Nobody had to embellish anything. I felt the Holy Spirit first time in my life. It was like when I, when I asked the Lord to save me, and it was, please save me, I'm, I carry the track around in my Bible. It's a Xerox copy of a nothing track with the wrong scripture on it. I got saved on that. That's precious to me. Okay, but what's precious about it is my cousin, who is weird, he's saved, but he's weird. He took seven minutes to tell me about Jesus Christ. And I know that it's not incredible that he should raise the dead. Because he took my old dead mortal body and let me lift up the shade and the light came on. I have not been the same in 32 years. If you think I'm bad now, 32 years ago you didn't even want to talk to me. But what, what is so important about that? Why is it so incredible? 90% of the people you talk to don't believe that. Don't believe that Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, was born of a virgin... There's a million reasons why that happened. Okay, he was raised up at the age of 33 and a half, sacrificed on a cross for you. For you personally. I got a personal Savior. It's, it's real to me. I mean, it, it changed my life. Now, I know we have a lot of friends, and... I've been going to more funerals than I want to. But Hebrews says, it's appointed unto man once to die, but then to judgment. Well, when you die, what you decided in life determines what zip code you're going to. One's heaven, one's hell. I know I'm at 00001, okay? Heaven. I know I'm going there. The book told me that. I could, I could fall asleep reading this book before I got saved. I'd get through the title and I'd be asleep. When I got saved, I, I carried this thing with me everywhere I went. Every chance I got, I read something. I was a, a million and one questions. Chuck, you met me when I first got saved at, over at Blessed Hope. And Hank Scoggins came to my house. I've told that story a hundred times. One man changed my life. Well, actually two. My cousin witnessed to me, and I said, yep, didn't know what to do with it. Hank Scoggins comes to put a wood stove in my house, and from that day to the day he died, he was making sure I was doing what I was supposed to do. He was feeding me all the time. I bet you he fed you, Chuck. If I have questions, <coughs> I don't have a Hank anymore. Chuck's got a million calls for me, haven't you? Some of the stuff he's like, what is he talking about? You know, but I'm just, I'm thinking of something. Well, Chuck probably knows that answer. But Jesus Christ, we're trying to talk to people that don't know the Lord. Why did he, you think it's incredible that, that Jesus Christ should be raised from the dead? Why did he die? He died because you're a sinner, Jones. We, 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 don't, we don't convey that story. We don't, you know, I'm, in the last 18 months, my outside involvement in society has, has changed. It's the, the, the government or the society itself has limited your contact with people. Why go knock on a door when they won't open the door? You know, I'm sorry, I've had that, that's kind of permeated my thinking right now. I'm going to change that. Um, but we've, we've been taken out of places. I was in five ministries. Then I was in nothing. I mean, we were, 
We were coming, we weren't even coming to church for a while. You know, that's that's Satan at work. Why? He doesn't want you to understand why it's not so incredible that God can raise the dead. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe the tenets of our gospel by which ye are saved. If you don't understand that, how are you going to tell someone else? Go to Ezekiel 3. I know this is Old Testament, but there's some application here I want you to try and It's in the Old Testament, right, Ezekiel? Um, 18. When I say unto you, unto the wicked, that ye shall surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save life, the same wicked man shall die in his inequity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from the wicked way, he shall die in his inequity, but thou shalt hast delivered thy soul. What does the Great Commission say? Go ye therefore teaching and preaching. Preaching what? The gospel. All right, the good news. You know, that's a commandment. We're supposed to go. When we get to the end of that parking lot is where your mission field starts. So, I don't have a long message. The message that I'm saying is, in the Old Testament, the Lord said, them that hate me. But if you came into the fold, he kind of forgave you. I hated the Lord because I didn't honor, respect, worship him as he needs to be worshiped. Because I didn't know him. I didn't know him because I hadn't met an individual, but that's not exactly true. I can remember being witnessed two other times. <coughs> One of them was, I'm not proud of this, I was in White Plains Regional Park watching a little kid's softball game. I just finished playing golf, and a friend of mine was sitting up there drinking a beer, watching kids. This little teeny woman came over and skinned me alive. And I went, oops, I got convicted a little bit. Another woman started talking to me in tongues. I kind of lost interest. But she was telling me about the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard it on Wednesday, October 30th, 1990, about 11, 10 in the morning. I heard it. It stabbed me in the heart. I was, I was a believer. But someone took seven minutes to tell me, how much time have you taken this week, this month, this year, to tell someone the greatest news that ever came out of a graveyard is it incredible that God should raise the dead. Do you believe that? Tell somebody that. That's the message. I'm sorry. Lord, we just thank you now for this time. Appreciate all that you've done. Thank you for your son and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.